Next up, Super Soul Solutions with Marilee Milmo. Let's see what she's got in store for today's amazing show. Marilee, welcome back. <laughs> Thanks, Nicole. How's my sound doing? Doing great. Yay. Okay. okay. Yay. Hi there, everyone. Welcome to Super Soul Solutions, and thanks for joining in today. I hope most of you got a chance to listen to my last show with special guest and dear friend Dan Drayson, who's an expert in the afterlife and near-death experience. So following in that theme, I wish to share a compilation of insights that I have gathered over 20 years from interviewing hundreds of near-deathers and studying the massive research on proof of reincarnation and recently having a blast talking to the new children who are being born, who remember who they were and do not have as thick of what is called a forgetfulness veil as many of us do from the previous generations. There are so many people today that I need to give credit to, and I'm not going to, so just trust, because I'm doing a huge compilation of many, many, many different sources and beings, and um, all of them have crossed over to the other side, which is a word I prefer to use rather than death or dying, and they have chosen to remain closer to the earth rather than going on to higher frequencies so they can communicate and let us know, the ones here that are, you know, we're d- dumbed down and we, we don't totally, most of us remember who we are. So they want us to know to not to have any fear of death because it does not truly exist. And they also wish to share information. So that's the information I am passing along today. As you know, we are in the middle of a historical reset, that's obvious, and it has happened before, and it has had to happen now to wake more people up. The planet's soul is in distress, and the lack of humans understanding that they are one with nature, the planet, and all life needs to be put in their backyard and doorstep for us to truly awake. So I'm going to address the questions that I promised and put down on the uh, advertising for this show. And all of these answers comes from beings communicating from the other side, okay? What's the number one truth change that stops suffering quickly? And this, quote, if the majority of people could see the suffering and cruel death as parts of themselves, interior, not exterior to them, the change could happen quickly. Now, this sentence came from some wonderful books where Francis Vaughn, who synchronistically is a scholar I met who lived in the same town I'm living in, and she crossed over fairly recently. And she um, she is kind of imparting that what's going on now has to happen dramatically because otherwise people don't experience it and take it to heart in general, unless you're full on empath. So many are telling me, many on the other side are telling me that the most important thing that to ask people to do right now is to take action in small or large ways to support and live the life they know is possible. We're in a vacuum right now in between the old coming down and the new needing to be created by us co-creators. And to not allow ourselves to be intimidated because they said we need leaders and each one of you has leadership in your own ways. We need leaders that are motivated by a balance of pragmatic spirituality and moral strength who can reach out easily with others in their neighborhood and support one another in creating new businesses, new inspirations, and new ways of living. Courageous moral character and people of all ages stepping forward and actually putting into action to create their dreams are the most beneficial actions to take right now. And so many sources have stressed that. So, more wisdom from the other side. The breath of source created and thereby allows everyone a direct connection to source. So, your oversoul is, you can kind of think of it like a huge circle with the central sun and thousands of rays like 
spokes in a wheel radiating out from the center. And each soul, each one of you has had thousands of lives. And underneath the soul, so to speak, and I had never heard this before except for all the beings crossing over. They said, actually, underneath, so to speak, the, the oversoul and soul is spirit which interestingly enough actually brings more life to the soul in the sense of different personalities, different aspects, and different experiences. So the next question I promised to find the answer to was what is the major drive that ignites each soul? The answer is simple, to evolve the divine nature within us a drive to become all that is. Next question. What does it mean to be alive? Aliveness is the realization and knowing that we are infinite and immortal beings. This soul knowing emanates from the heart and expands its capacity by every word, action, and service done with compassion and honoring the divinity in each and every being, animal, and life form on this planet and beyond. So please spend time sitting quietly with your heart and soul. What is death? They laugh at this because they know death isn't real. And after they laugh, they say, death is a change of a moving address where you have a much more expansive and joy-filled realization of the fullness of yourself and all of creation and the love that resides within it. Now, there are so many people I could reference, but there are, I've had three friends whose sons recently uh, suicided. So I chose a young man who suicided named Eric, who is communicating hugely from the other side uh, to help his bereaved mother and, and also through all the friends and the family to comfort and inform her and others. And he said, death, really, the concept of death, right? <laughs> it uh, doesn't exist. And it leads to reincarnation, which gives us another opportunity to reincarnate a regeneration opportunity, the soul kicking it up again. Now, these questions that I um, came up with were kind of more advanced questions than I normally read about, and that's why I picked the questions. They're bullet points that were always shown in every show I do regarding um, the News for the Soul, Merrily Melmo page. So that's, I usually will, talk about the bullet points or the questions that will be addressed. Also, a few people email me and let ask me for any specific questions regarding the subject that we're talking about that they would like answered. And I was hoping to have question and answer at the end of the show, but Nicole informed me that they are having technical difficulties and that won't be possible. So I'm trying right now to answer the questions that not only I promised, but that other people wrote in, just to be clear about that. Okay, so Eric, a young man, continues. And uh, he says, it gives us an opportunity, another opportunity to reincarnate when you, quote, die or cross over. A regeneration opportunity, the soul kicking up itself up again. Think of your oversoul as the highest and larger, largest part of your source self. Like I said, a huge circle with like a central sun with thousands of spokes coming out of the center. And each one of those spokes can be your lifetimes and experiences because an oversoul can run at least five lifetimes consciously and simultaneously. This aspect of no time or simultaneous time on the other side is the most, is a little disconcerting and the first adjustment one makes when crossing over from this reality to that. There is no time and things are simultaneous and it's just amazing. 
they all are just talk about it being magnificent. But it does take some adjustment to that. So one of the reasons I'm doing this show is that if we prepare ourselves for the quality and the ease of which we can cross over, that the consciousness that we cross over with will equate to the experience we have and the ease we have in uh, coalescing more into the hugeness of who we are and moving on with uh, our life in grace. So that's why I'm one of the reasons I'm doing the show. And I appreciate you all being open and curious to learning or what I call relearning. So having this knowledge or wisdom allows one to let go of grief faster after a loved one has departed. And as the Buddhists teach, as the audience I'm sure knows, non-attachment. Because attachment creates human grief and clinging because we have been conditioned and taught the illusion of separation while on earth. And they, uh, all the communicators say, you are never alone on earth, even though we realize you feel that. And I'd like to add, before Atlantis fell, it was normal for us to communicate with our soul and with helpers and angels and guides as easily as we communicated with each other. And then when that fell, the frequency dropped and we uh, uh, found ourselves in kind of a deeper forgetfulness veil. So this is a time of re-remembering. I think where I'd like to take, so those are some of the questions uh, that I promised uh, in my bullet points and that were called in. So I, I believe the most useful thing at this time is to give you a six-step map of taking you through the six steps of reincarnation when you die, or I prefer to say crossovers. So you will kind of know what to expect and have a map in your heart and mind. So the first step is the body programs or prepares you. So I'm starting with birth, okay, with you being born into a new body. The first step is body programming by the soul, okay, preparing for a new life. So the, the, the characters on the other side, the beings on the other side, refer to our body, believe it or not, as meat suits or avatars. Uh, and they do that with a laugh, but that's literally how they look at it. It's not that they don't consider it sacred. They just consider it like a suit you wear and take off after you have finished what you came to do. So the soul is working hard at that point to program the embryo with the body and traits it will need once the soul occupies that body or what you would call an avatar. This programming is generally done in the first trimester. And the programming comes from the soul to the body, not the other way around. You also, at that early, early embryo stage, haven't developed an ego yet. And the soul takes advantage of that when it programs you. And, uh, you, you all that have listened to my shows know I'm very passionate about water and its intelligence. So the embryo, remember, is floating in a water medium, which is a high electrical conductor of energy, and it's easier for the soul to download its blueprint, its intentions into that body that it will eventually inhabit because you are immersed in, in the water. So I've spoken to many healers, and they say the soul does not generally begin to occupy the body until after the third month, so the end of the first trimester, because the brain generally isn't developed enough to begin to have a conversation and input with it. Some souls don't fully come in until birth time, but they certainly claim the body, they've picked the parents, the location, and they hover over it, and they're working with the body so that uh, the body will be a beautiful vehicle for the soul to accomplish what its contract and what it came to do. And the interesting thing, if you haven't learned this, is up to six years old, our brain generates a theta wave, that, and that is why children up to six are like sponges and do not differentiate between reality and imagination. For them, it is one thing, as it also is in higher worlds, by the way. One always creates through imagination. So around six years old, the soul begins to lose control, which is kind of an interesting way of saying it, because the ego and the sense of self is being developed and may begin to have a life of its own. 
So that's the first step is all, it's a lot of planning, a lot of design, a lot of figuring out what you want to accomplish, a lot of picking parents, locations, this and that, and then kind of claiming a body, then the soul helping to design that body along with other things and helpers that can help with you. And then getting used to being in a body again, usually kind of hovering, bringing part of yourself in and out, and then, uh, and then eventually, you know, full incarnation. So now the second stay, step of the whole reincarnation cycle is what we would obviously call birth or life. So you are born and have your life with a new body or meat suit, which is a unique design and opportunity for your specific soul. A soul is not something you have. It is what you are. And by the way, each time you incarnate, you tend to choose different bodies and sexes because your soul learns the most from a diversity of experience. The soul does have, oh, sorry, does not have a gender. And it loves who it loves. And depending on lives it has chosen and what it's done, it has a unique blend of what we, we on earth refer to as masculine and feminine energy. So as souls progress, they generally choose more balance of the two, which is why I think bisexuality is becoming a little more common and is found in a lot of advanced souls. And this is, of course, a hard reprogramming for many of us humans to accept who were conditioned by outside authority figures to tell us what was right or wrong or appropriate. But I'm sharing with you the soul's perspective and what the beings who just crossed over have had earth lives are telling you is their truth. And it's pretty much the same across the board with slight variations. So you live life with all its challenges. And generally, by the way, uh, you might be interested in this. Um, you choose up to five exit strategies at different times of your life. So if life becomes too much, maybe you'll, you'll exit your body by an accident or you'll exit by a illness or something like that. And there'll be a lot of people exiting right now and in the near future. One, because they don't want to go through the energy that is necessary in this whole time of rebuilding. And they feel, they, their soul feels they can be more useful helping and assisting from the other side. So the third stage is what we call the death process. And they all describe it as like taking off your PJs. They said uh, it's like slipping out of your body, usually through the head chakra or subtle energy center. And in order to cross over, most people begin to remove. I don't know if, how many of you are, I'm sure almost everyone has been around someone who's dying. But one of the things I've noticed is people can do it in many different ways, but they tend to remove more and more of their energy over time out of their body, kind of to the other side. And one sign of this is you'll notice their facial skin begins to get almost like see-through. And uh, I've had three incidents, because I, I help kids be born and I help people cross over, is right before crossing over, they actually often say, I see my family waiting for me up there, and they point to the ceiling. And at that point, their hand like grasps and they float out of their body. And then pretty soon you immediately see the light go out of their eyes. And if you're super aware, you actually can see sometimes or feel the wispy kind of soul leaving at that time. So they describe it on the other side is that crossing over is about disengaging from the body. So the more you have been taught that you are a body and ego, the more attached and fearful you will tend to be about letting go when the soul calls you back. And this is why it's good to prepare yourself now. So uh, the fourth stage is a life review. Now, it usually happens pretty close to passing. You have a life review. And it's not what most people are afraid of or think. Everyone experiences during their life review how challenging being human really is, yet they are awed by what they went through and the magnificence they are simultaneously experiencing as they now know their true nature again. So during your life review, you are accessing and assessing 
how you feel you did with your contracts and purpose. So when you come into life, you usually will design, you, you meet with your soul family and you kind of design and go, okay, I'd like to do this and you play this part and you do this part and you guys laugh and you argue and you talk and, you know, you make up all that, like, like uh, being actors in a play. So um, that's generally called contracts. So this includes choosing how you will die, where and what you want to explore. And so, by the way, after the life review, many astral travelers, many astral travelers, when they astral travel, see a silver cord attached to them connecting to their soul. So I was asking when I was interviewing all these beings, I was asking them, when does a silver cord non-attached to the soul, which no longer allows a near-death experience because it won't allow you, once that silver cord non-attaches, you cannot come back into the same body. So they said that happens after your life review. So uh, I would imagine when you life review, you are sure you want to stay on the other side. You're pretty sure you don't want to come back in and regenerate the body you just left. And uh, that takes some wide range, wide bandwidth, looking across many lifetimes to seeing which best serves you and all involved. So that's why the silver cord generally is not attached after the life review. I hope that helps some of you out. So um, I had some of my friends say to me, Merrily, I don't want to come back to her. That's too hard. And what I'd like to tell them is you don't need to reincarnate back to Earth. It is actually a free will choice, and you can incarnate to other planets and dimensions. There are thousands to choose from. And actually, your soul is living many multidimensional, simultaneous experiences and realities on a lot of different planes. But we're not going to get into that. We're just going to stick with the the, uh, steps of uh, uh, dying. So um, I also had another friend ask me, why do so many souls come to Earth? And this is one of the most exciting, awesome things, you guys. Um, I'm sure you sense this, but to actually know this is like, woohoo! Okay, the thing about Earth, billions of planets with life on it. So the thing about Earth is that on Earth, you achieve the fastest soul growth due to the more challenges that Earth life represents. You are learning how to navigate a body with lots of emotions and dealing with others, people's behavior who don't remember who they are either. And then there's rules of the game on earth, you know, that you, you create time with each other, that you appear solid to each other. And all of this, it's a huge multiple lessons, especially all the emotions that can take you over. Um, because the soul perspective doesn't have that perspective. The soul perspective is not personal in that sense. It wouldn't get its feelings hurt in that sense. It doesn't worry about you paying bills in that sense. So um, according to the communications from the departed, uh, let's see, how do I say this? Um, During the life review, you see the deficit that you had where love was concerned. So the departed ones say that is the general barometer for creating the next agenda or lifetime when you're designing that. And they said the absolute truth is your soul evolves much quicker on earth than anywhere else, including where they are. Okay. Now I have been told this by so many different beings, both in body here and out where they literally said merrily, A hundred years on earth, in terms of evolutionary soul growth, which is what a lot of us are about, because the more you grow, the wiser you become, the more experiences you have, the more integrated you become, the, the more you can share that with others, the more you provide a map for all other beings across the universe to access. So it's really awesome. So he was saying a hundred years on earth is equal Actually, several were saying this, 10,000 years of learning on other planes and planets. So I want you all to applaud yourself, okay, because a whopper here. 
So an Andromedan also once told me, um, it was hysterical. He says, you, you humans uh, amaze me. And, of course, we're beyond humans. We're infinite souls. But he said, you humans amaze me because I don't even, we, don't, we don't even understand how you survive past a day. And we also don't understand how you can create it anything and you ask them why and they say because every second you are riddled in your brain and your feelings with 15 conflicting emotions and thoughts and I just started cracking up because I said that's so that's so true you know so we must look like multiple personalities super just crazy beings because many of these other beings that work with us and off planet have maybe two emotions, you know, so this is sort of just an awe that we can even survive days here. And these are things we take for granted because it's all we remember, but really all you guys out there, it's awesome. So the other big thing they stress over and over and over and over and over and over and over again is there and, and our religious programming or whatever programming you've had and conditioning is the opposite of this, okay? They literally said there is no right or wrong. The soul does not whine or get upset about the things you might think it does. The veil of forgetfulness provides accelerated learning because I'm always gone, why am I forgetting this? Why can't I remember this? You know, ever since I was a little kid, why can't I move that object? And blah, 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 blah. Well, I hadn't looked at it in a more positive way, which it actually – by us having something to slightly push against as a goal, to slightly resist, rather than kind of having more effortless things, it actually builds the strength of our character up and um, makes us grow in different ways that wouldn't be possible on many of the other planes where you immediately know who you are. So it's more of a slight positive viewpoint, which I'm sure many of you have already considered. So the more diversity of experience, the faster your soul evolves. It's like getting or creating, let's see, how do I say it, a broader soul portfolio. (laughs) Okay? So, um, and on the other side is just like having a bird's eye overall view of your existence on Earth. So during the life review, as I said, you see the deficits that you had where love was concerned. And... According to communication from the departed, that is the barometer for creating the next agenda or lifetime. So you tend to pick up your next leg of the journey. It depends on how much you feel, no one's judging you, how much you feel you progress, and how much love you have in your heart. I'm telling you the bottom line of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours. These are like the bottom lines that they say. So the fifth stage is called, you could call it the hangout or some call it the holding place. And I think Catholics sometimes in the programming they have think of it as purgatory, but there is no such thing. Um, According to thousands and thousands who've crossed over and are communicating, those who speak from the other side suggest that religion is a completely human-made construct for comfort is how they put it. Again, they're not judging. They're just... They, they just talk like it's fact. So before reincarnating again, we hang out with guides and our soul family, participating members, and then that's when we create the life contract of intention with each other. Like, I'll do this on earth, and you do this, and okay. So it's actually, it's almost like a negotiation of sorts choosing enough challenges, right, but not too many that you feel you won't be able to handle it. So and remember, we make these determinations from being a fearless, soul-filled state of knowing that we are immortal, infinite, and connected to source. So we'll, I'm sure many of you feel like, oh, wow, I took on a bit much, you know, because um, it is challenging here. But it's also amazing. It's amazing. I'm so excited at this time on life right now. So, and as you know, Earth life takes a lot of focus and energy to get something done in action, which is another purpose for you not for you having the veil of forgetfulness is you would be way too distracted if you could remember all your lifetimes, you know, simultaneously and all that. You probably, you know, it's just, it's hard enough to remember to do the stuff you need to do in this life. So, 
When you cross over, by the way, I'm sure you've heard this in data is um, that you've read, uh, you're greeted by Buddha, Jesus, relatives, your dog, <laughs> whatever. And really what most of the time with that is a, is a projection of what you wish to see because you're an amazing creator and that will give you comfort and help the crossing over be easier for you by having someone there familiar who you love or who you feel productive. So you generally don't instantaneously hang out with all your extended soul family or your peeps and your friends because a lot when they first they cross over are adjusting in general to remembering and realizing their true nature as a soul that they are not dead, that they are one with all, infinite and immortal. They feel the love unconditionally, and they know there's no hell and all this other programming. And at the same time, they're learning how to move as an energetic being, which is done by their intent. So they're in this amazing re-remembering discovery. So that kind of needs to happen before, of course, you plan your next life. You have to get and, – and there are some also – no judgment here. Some souls need some R and R, which I call rehab and recentering, because they had really tough lives and they just need there's no time over there, but this is my way of saying they need time and assistance to help process everything. And they are regaining a lot of knowledge that they have access to because you can access any knowledge. I mean, we can do that here, but we're not very well trained at that. Some people call it the Akashic Records, but pretty much um, they don't even worry about memory because they say anything you want to know, you can immediately access. It's there. So um, I asked a couple of them, what about this tunnel of light that everyone, you know, talks about? Uh, Hundreds have said, oh, yeah, you enter a ton of light, you go blah, 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 blah. Well, um, now, most of these that have said that, by the way, are near-deathers who re-entered back into their same body, even though it was, they, the body was clinically declared dead from anywhere. From three minutes to the longest I interviewed was 12 hours. And, whoa, it's like, surprise, I'm back. It's just like, whoa. And getting their body operating again is no easy trick. So here's a key point that a couple of them said about the light, the tunnel of light, which also made sense to me, but was not what I had heard before from others. The light is different, brighter, or dimmer for everyone because the light is indicative of the level of consciousness that you aspire to in this lifetime. Some people who were conditioned to be atheistic and that think they are dead and that life doesn't continue, experience darkness for a while. They're actually creating it because, again, they're denied co-creators. And I have a quick story to tell you about my grandfather. He was an interesting being and very, I didn't get to know him really well, but very stubborn and quite the... Um, dandy you know if you can believe this a pink convertible uh you know just the whole thing but anyway he crossed over and 10 years after that i was having a reading by one of my favorite psychics and she said by the way your grandfather david is stuck on the other side and i said really i said boy that was a long time ago i said what's going on and she said his conditioning his knowing is that he is dead and he is like lying on his back with almost like Egyptian with his hands crossed over his chest, not moving. And basically angels and stuff are there to ha help him and suggest and move him, you know, towards the light or move him on. It doesn't have to be towards the light, but just move him on. But they also need to be asked. And they said, he's just been like this ever since it's crossed over. So I said, well, what do you need from me? And they, they said, we need you to just project yourself over there and do what you can to wake him up. So me being somewhat uh, <laughs> irreverently reverent, so I projected myself and I pictured him in front of me and I slapped as hard as I could his face. And I said, David, wake up now. Just like that. And, and she, she jumped, and she goes, oh, my God, he's moving. <laughs> and he opened his eyes. I said, you're not dead. Snap out of it and grow up. And, I mean, that's literally how I talked to him. And he 
set his energetic body up, and she was re- relaying the whole thing. And she says, well, no one's ever done it quite like that. But she says, now the angels are coming to him, and he looks completely stunned. And But she said he'll be fine. So, you know, it just shows you when we're so shut down or, or whatever, uh, we have to kind of, like Yoda said, first is to unlearn all that you have learned. <laughs> so, so when you're also, someone said, well, do I lose my individuality when I cross over? No, you are still an individual. So your soul is less concerned with personality traits at that point. And many of those traits slip away gradually as well as memories and return to the fullness of the essence of who you really are. So you can still access anything in any lifetime you need to, but you just begin to care less and less in the super personal way, you know. So some beings will hold themselves, like I said, close to earth to help us down here try to remember, try to relax, try to not be scared, try to not be control freaks, all those things by by informing us what happened to them and what they went through. So, um, and they also have access to certain knowledge and things to help us through these current transition times on earth. So uh, people like Frances Vaughn is a very old soul and she could have easily gone up higher, but she stayed here because she wants to help, I mean, stayed close to earth on the other side because she wants to help. And many of these, like Eric, the one who suicided, is writing a book with his mother on all these things. And her, his mother is completely healed from all of this stuff because it's like she has, she said, I have the best conversations and communication I've ever had before. I ever had when he was alive. So um, very interesting. So now the sixth and last stage is life planning, which I talked about a little bit. And light workers, those of you who define yourself by light workers, generally are motivated to come back to serve, to assist others, to awaken so we can all move forward. So the focus for that life planning is what do I want and need to do focusing on soul evolution? People who are, shall we say, not light workers are just kind of working on the human experience alone, uh, so to speak. They, they kind of ask, what do I want to do personally? And there are gradients in between. So the reason to come to earth, all of these beings say this from the other side, is to be of service. This will not surprise any of the audience, I'm sure. To be of service while being in divine love and learning more about divine love and balance with wisdom through action as co-creators. So coming to the ultimate realization that there is only love, you feel complete. Like people here are going, really, I feel incomplete. And I go, really? And they go, yes, you know, or you feel really alone. And um, so you come in thousands of times to get to that point of awareness and where your actions as much as possible become more and more integrated and in a balance of love and wisdom. So they all said life is a cycle that never ends. There's always more to learn no matter what stage you're playing at and to explore and serve. And the most important is to remember you are love and how to love, which to me means also forgiving. So that also means we experience what love is not, don't we? So um, the key they're talking about, because they can, if if they're really close to earth, they'll, they'll have a little more compassion for us. But if they've been up there for a while, they kind of like want to politely and lovingly spank us, quite frankly. So they say, stop personalizing life. It is not personal as such. It is all for adding to the greater good. You miss vital lessons when you get stuck in fear or insecurity. Remember, darkness is defined by ignorance. So you set up contracts of what you will do with others and accomplish and um, to move through any of these challenges that we have, which are many on earth. So um, someone just uh, emailed me who's listening to the show, one of my clients, and she said, how do you know what your soul contract may be? Well, uh, I do that with quantum healing hypnosis therapy with people myself, uh, something I'm trained to do. But a good way that you all could self-determine 
what your soul contract is, is kind of the most obvious, is to look at your hobbies and what you are drawn to spend time doing. It's going to be the natural abilities and skills you brought in and what moves you. It's not like you have to do something you hate. That, you know, that needs to stop. That's like the old thinking. So I know, for me, I know I'm on my stronger path, like a tree, and everyone's heard this analogy. We have our roots in the ground if we're balanced. We have our, you know, heaven on earth. We're a strong tree, and then we have all these branches going all different directions, trying on different things, multiple personalities. So we can get off a little on a branch, and then we kind of come back to the center. I did that myself in my life for, I think, about eight years. I just kind of went into a block stage. So um, I know, for me, I know I'm on the, there's no right or wrong, so, but I'm going to use this word just in this um, purpose. I know, for me, I'm on the right path when I think or feel lighter about something I'm thinking or a decision rather than heavier. That's how I prefer to look at it. It's not good or bad. It is not uh, like that. It is, is it lighter and uplifting if I think about doing this or feel this, or is it heavier and intense, okay? So I try to follow the lighter things, and, of course, the brain comes in and tells you all the reasons why that can't happen, and I just basically try to ignore that So and process it. So when you are after that, after you're doing your soul contract and setting all that up, then you're ready to go back to stage one with your soul family team and guides to create a new plan for a new reincarnation experience anywhere. Uh, and I mean anywhere. Okay, I've talked to super soldiers who's gone beyond this universe. I mean, there is so much out there to play with and explore. So um, someone else just emailed me, too, who's listening. Oh, this is so sweet that you guys are listening. Um, and they said, can I just come back? It's my dog. <laughs> And um, the answer to that, actually, is yes. Depending on what one needs to learn or how one chooses to learn it, one can take on different biological forms. And like the ET worlds, are often, extraterrestrials are often more sophisticated than us, not better, but sometimes more advanced. And they can be an exciting and different inspiration to humans. Uh, generally, your soul would need to put its entire self into an animal, per se, or a plant, but can certainly do that. And it can, um, I've talked to a gentleman who I'm pretty good friends with who's running five multiple bodies at the same time and conscious of it. So there, I'm telling you, there's all kinds of wild opportunities. So another um, confusing thing someone said is, will you give us your take or what they say about karma? Because we hear so much about karma and we have this like kind of freaky thing like, oh, we're gonna, you know, there's going to be judgment and I'm not perfect enough and all this kind of stuff. So, what they said more or less, and remember this is coalescing of many people, is traumas from past lives can cause a lot of harm in our current lives. People get hung up on thinking it's punishment. When you die on earth, your karma, in a sense, dies with you, in a sense. It doesn't translate to your next life in the same way that most people think. If someone feels that they need to clear up karma from their last life, like a physical ailment, and yet they decide it still has learning potential for them, it may come back with you in your next life. Now, I know birthmarks do this. Uh, I've discovered that your birthmark was the way that you were generally killed in your most previous life, so to speak. So that's kind of fascinating. That's where they, they're having kind of a carryover. So um, a lot of people, as you know, are still, like us, are still in the process of reintegrating pieces of them. And especially if they've had a lot of trauma, um, those pieces, they have to do kind of soul retrieval and get them back integrated into the whole self. And we also are multidimensional, whether we're aware of it or not. So our soul is many realities at the same time. But um, so for me, when I contemplate that, karma becomes more of a moot point as long as I forgive myself and others. So um, that's the way to keep myself health, you know, healthy 
and not feeling like I subconsciously have to punish myself for something, right, or learn something. Because when you're a multidimensional being, you're living all these lifetimes, which, of course, we don't remember till we cross over and get to see all of that. We have sorted a lot out, but there is this drive uh, forward to um, unfolding perfection. We're already perfection, but there's this inner drive that all souls have to go to all that is, to be more a part of all that is, to, you know, expand. That is just inbuilt in them. So, uh, so of course, as you guys know, um, karma is only necessary if I live in a separate consciousness, so to speak, and it can refine you and evolution of your soul occurs through that as a feeling feedback to remind you, you are one. So love of yourself, love of others, and the realization that all for one and one are all. And also karma acts or can act as a mirror and is showing you the reflection you are giving it. So without a mirror, it is impossible for us to self-realize. And I've worked with kids that never had anyone mirror to them who they were, and they're just uh, have a very little sense of self and insecurity. So for every action, we receive a feedback action and get to explore a world more in depth, thus becoming more empowered. So karma is a way for those souls that were say, oblivious about their actions and outcomes to experience being not always, it's not tit for tat, but being on the other end of it in another experience or lifetime, which is the way to develop greater compassion. I have developed much greater compassion than I came in with by experiencing certain things. So um, my my friend who asked, uh, can I come back as my dog, uh, just emailed me and said, when someone or an animal is dying or being killed, do they suffer a lot? So um, the good news is almost always when someone goes through tremendous pain, including animals, they go into a type of unconsciousness, whether literal or not, they literally check out. So I even interviewed survivors who had jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge. I said, do you remember going down into the water? They said, no, I remember saying a prayer but there, I remember jumping, and I remember waking up in the water. So this is a, an inbuilt self-preservation thing that was installed in humans and animals uh, so that we don't have to, you know, have severe traumatic memories and that they're more vague. So um, uh, one of my friends who lost one of her sons, uh, of course, you can never lose someone, but I'm being respectful for how it feels for her. Is um, there's a big karmic thing when someone suicides? There's this big spiritual, you know, oh, they get a lot of karma. And I've asked everyone I possibly know on the other side, not here. The mediums here go, yes, you have karma. There they say, no, you don't. So um, I asked, does that mean they need to reincarnate again to learn? And the answers I got from three different boys on the other side that all did a suicide as an exit said no to an end, another experience. The immense growth lessons can also be for those left behind, so to speak, to transform the sense of loss with a new connection and connecting in a new way to themselves and others. That's why we are communicating to our family so they are comforted, take it less personally, and we all can expand together. So um, the last bullet point I had promised you on my uh, pre-announcement that I'd like to finish with is how do we create and live meaningful lives in these rebalancing times and achieve 5D consciousness? I'm only using that term fifth dimensional consciousness um, because most of you understand that. So the answer is really simple. So I asked the beings on the other side, and almost all of them said this, like combination of two sentences. Be grateful. These are five things, which is funny. How to be 5D consciousness with five things. Be grateful. Be loving. Be kind. Be forgiving. Be compassionately wise. 
We all need to refuse to participate in divisiveness, right or wrong judgment, and no more hatred, please. That will evolve us in the world faster than anything, as well as becoming leaders in as small or large a way as possible, rather than waiting for the government or somebody else when all of that is falling apart to tell you what to do. Remember, that is a programming for 500,000 years to humans to give your power away to any kind of authority figure. That needs to stop. You are enough as you are, and it is, as you know, the moral, whatever the moral quality of your beingness is, and you will know that by how you feel about yourself, right? If we feel good about ourselves, then most likely our, our actions and, and our words and whatever, for the most part, have been very good because it's, it's impossible, excuse my coarse language here, it's impossible to bullshit the soul. And it really is impossible to bullshit yourself if you're integrated enough. So the other answer they gave me is simple, the golden rule. Do unto others as you would do yourself. And I kind of laughed with them and I said, well, you know, I work on a lot of amazing women and they're all servers and they'll tend to not, they'll tend to treat others better than they do themselves. And I said, I'm not in agreement with that. And they said, yes, you are correct because ultimately there is no other. And so um, that golden rule, you know, needs to take that into consideration that do unto others as you would yourself in the most loving, you know, high integrity way. So they also said the quality of perseverance, doing your activity with love, integrity and wholesomeness, understanding all is one is very very important. So I'm looking at our time. We've got a couple minutes. And um, oh, let's see what I can share with you. There's so much about the other side and how wondrous all of you are in terms of your abilities and uh, what you're capable of. So we will be going through some rocking and rolling. It is the least of what has been um, consciously, mass consciously and subconsciously decided will impact the people so they no longer, so they'll be nudged into growth or not, rather than this kind of halfway point of letting everyone else tell you what to do and what the rules are and that we're overwhelmed with all the stuff we're, we're doing. So um, this puts us all in more or less, not similar footing, but, you know, quarantine and all of those kind of things. And also the earth has, as you all know, has demanded that, actually. Many, many scenarios were looked at with quantum computers and in the mass consciousness field of what would be the least loss of people but provide the most impact in a functional way. So um, so that is why I answered the question of what will stop the suffering quickly and uh, earlier on this session because we can do this quickly and uh, quicker than we think. And so part of it, and this is my lesson, is not to make anybody the bad guys or the good guys or this or that uh, because we've all had many, many lifetimes of every kind of dying and uh, now is the time for those of us that have taken some time to work on integrating ourselves and following, no matter how subtle, your true knowingness. It's just for us to keep emanating and beaming that so that the mass consciousness can be more permeated with that. And we will make it through. I'm very, very, very excited about this time. So, so thank you so much. Thank you so, so much. Um, and by the way, a lot of this information 
from other beings came through channeling different people that they contacted that were friends of the family or something that they knew they could get through because when a parent is in grief and lost their children, it's so hard to get to the, through the grief and those intense emotions. And um, so grief is normal and it's a process, but that is often why it takes a while for uh, someone from your family to directly communicate to you. They mo- telepathically, they most likely will try to bring signs to you. Um, thanks so much, you guys. I hope you enjoyed the show. And um, I'll see you in two weeks from now. And I don't know what I'll talk about yet or what will be up. So it'll be a surprise, but you can always check like three days to a week earlier on my radio page on News for the Soul because I always give you a brief outline of what will be discussed, okay? And apologize that I wasn't able to take direct questions. I was hoping to, but, but, you know, tech stuff happens. And thank you for your patience. Love you all. And uh, you can go, if you want, to my website, supersoulsolutions.com. And I do have a reincarnation page there. I also have a new human page there of these new humans coming in and children. And I'd also like to recommend a website called reincarnationresearch.com, which is pretty interesting, pretty fascinating. Um, It's a uh, Adams, the president Adams reincarnated into a guy named Semiku. And he has, his work is not so much political in this life as it is changing the paradigm through amazing reincarnation research. And what you'll see, for instance, is the, physiognomy or when, when someone is reincarnating and has a very important mission of a continuation of what they were doing, their facial features will be almost identical. So it's really a fascinating website. And for instance, he shows that Trump, and, and I'm not judging either one, okay, because, you know, the president sets a whole nother game going on, but, but Trump is uh, the exact same facial features as Nero, the Roman Roman emperor, which cracks me up. And um, it's kind of learning the same lesson in a different way. So anyway, it's just a fascinating thing to look at. And we're going to have more and more of these children coming in with full memory who will be talking to you. And they will not compromise. They will not be interested in the old systems. They're not interested in doing most stuff. They will also be uniquely wired. So, um, meaning, you know, dyslexia and stuff like that so that they don't get programmed from traditional school. So, anyway, hang in there, everybody. Love you all and onward and upward. Bye-bye for now.